good to see you folks out on this kind of a gray day, but nevertheless, I had to drive through it, so you're in good shape to just drive across town, unless you came from a long distance. But uh, I'm really excited to be in this area. Um, my family is from this area. My mom was raised in Camelton, New Brunswick, and my dad was raised in Miramichi City. Well, a little town called Logieville. And uh, yeah, they're farmers and all that stuff. But um, they used to travel this highway when they were dating, Highway 11. And I think they actually met at a high school dance here in Bathurst. So this is a very special place for me because it all began here. I don't know if you're from this area or if you're from this, uh, this, uh, this highway corridor of this uh, east coast of New Brunswick, but uh, yeah, we have family ties here, so we're maybe we're related. So that could even be the case this morning, but if that's the case, then please just hide because you don't probably don't want to be related to my family. Anyways, it's all good, but it's good to be with you. I'm here, as pastors mentioned, thank you so much, uh, pastor, for your kind uh invitation to be here today to fellowship with you folks and serve as he has shared with you already we we offer this great free service that we've been doing for 30 plus years and uh, we're glad to continue to do that uh, progressively as time rolls on as ability rolls on as we're allowed to do it as we're, we're free to do it we're, we're happy to do it but I'm representing um, our executive officers today who bring greetings to you and they are Dave Wells of course our general superintendent and Murray Cornelius who's our general executive director for international missions, or Mission Global, we call it, and um, Craig Burton, our new general secretary treasurer, who used to be my district superintendent in eastern Ontario, but got a new job last May. So we're, we're just thrilled to, to greet you folks this morning. How many of you are lifers in New Brunswick? How many of you are imports from other places? How many of you don't really care? Okay, thanks, man. All right. <laughs> So I'm just thrilled this morning to share with you this message about stewardship. Now, stewardship in the Bible is really simple, but it's very complicated. It's interesting because a lot of believers who have been in the faith for years and years don't even fully understand how deep and wide and powerful stewardship is in Scripture. In fact, stewardship is more than just how generous you are, which is kind of the assumption that people give is, all about giving, should we give more, how should we give, all of that. Stewardship, according to what I believe in Scripture, is about how you live and not just how you give. Does that make sense? There's more than just generosity of your wealth or your resources. Now, I use that word wealth with a little W, right, instead of a capital W, because most of us are just average income getting by that sort of income bracket. So so we're going to talk about some very deeply spiritual things and biblical things. We're going to talk about some natural and very practical things as we travel through the next moments. But I just really appreciate your folks' uh, kindness in, in having me. There's, of course, when we're preaching, we have to bring in the Greek, right? So I got a Greek word for you. Are you ready? You can say this. The word is oikonomia. That's pretty good. That's not bad. Now, you've got to say it with a Greek accent. Are you ready? You're like, what is a Greek accent? Well, I won't, I won't try. But oikonomia is the biblical New Testament Greek word for stewardship. It's a really interesting word because it has two parts. The first part, and if you were to translate it into English, generally it means the word economics. It's from the Greek word oikonomia. So you have your own personal economics. You receive things into your life and you give them away, or you spend them. And the relationship of the in versus the out is your personal economics, just like the province, just like the country, just like uh, so many parts of the world. So economics may be seem complicated, but it's actually very simple. It's the relationship between what you receive and how it leads your life. So it's kind of derived from this word oikonomia. The first part of the word means how you manage your household. So the oikos, which is not a Greek yogurt, by the way, is how you manage the household that God has given you. And that means your kids, and that means your grandkids, and that means everyone around your life. But it also means how you influence the people around your life, the sphere of influence that God has given you. So it's not just keeping it for the family. It's how do I minister this with these resources? 
Now, this can go beyond just your money. This can go into your time, your talent. It goes into your creativity. It goes into your baking ability. It goes into your ability to go shopping and find good deals to bless the school across the street. It makes a whole impact in your life. It becomes everything that God has given to us that we are now responsible to influence because the second part of the word, get this, is the word nomos, which means to distribute. So the intention of what the writers in Scripture are saying to us is God gives and you give away. You don't keep. You don't hoard. You don't, you don't get your security wrapped up and whether you have enough, and then if you're a little over or, or a little overabundant, then you start giving away then. No, God says give away now. Bless now. Why does he say that? Why are we called to be good stewards? Well, let me give you some principles. That God made us rulers over the works of his hands. He trusts us with everything and put it under our feet. So we are now privileged to be the managers of all the things that God has given. Isn't that awesome? And he's given a lot, hasn't he? How many of you are really blessed? How many of you would wish you were blessed more? Okay. There's always one in every crowd. I won't point out who it was back in the row. All right. Three key stewardship principles. Here we go. Number one, we are not the owners, folks. Get that into our heads right away because biblically we're not. The world says we are. Culture says we are. Uh, university degrees say that we earned it. But really, honestly, the, the Bible says that you can't take it with you and you didn't come with it. So in the meantime, you get to have it, keep it, use it, and then give it away. And then on the way out, we go with nothing. So that's why we write wills, by the way, <laughs> so we can distribute correctly our all of that we've accumulated but we are the faithful managers and you know what the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care is the definition of good stewardship that's secular but the biblical definition even goes better than that biblical stewardship is the practice of selflessly managing everything we've been given by god our talent our time our treasure our tongues emphasis on where the pastor could go for a whole message or series in the fall. Relationships, health, all those things become the temple of the Holy Spirit, all for God's glory. So it's way more than just giving, it's living. You know, the, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Look at look what the scripture says in Psalm 24. The world and all its people belong to him, for he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. Psalms 24. So this is a good principle. We're not the owners. Here's number two, is that stewardship is ultimately a partnership with God. We are with him through it all. He speaks to our hearts. The spirit walks with us. We walk in, in accord with the spirit, in step with the spirit. And the spirit speaks to us even about our money, ladies and gentlemen. And so if we know what God is saying to us, we obey. Genesis 2.15, great example where God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to take care of it. Now, the reality is that Adam didn't make the garden, and he didn't pay for the garden, and he didn't own the garden, but he was simply the manager of it. As such, we're asked by God to take good care of the garden of our lives. Adam and Eve eh, didn't do so good. May we do better. May we now, in hindsight, understanding the full counsel of God in his presence with the help of the Holy Spirit, we, may we do a whole lot better than that. Amen? And so we know that biblical stewardship, third point, is also investing what you've been entrusted with. It's, it's the distribution. It's the nomos. It's the to distribute. That we have been entrusted with these resources because God trusts us to do what's right in the time. I love the parable uh, of the talents, Matthew 25, verse 14 and on, where Jesus has talks about an owner. You're probably familiar with this if you've ever heard a sermon in church about giving. This is part of it. It's usually, you know, the owner goes away on a trip and he leaves behind three servants with a quantity of his resources. One of them, he gives five bags of coins, gold coins. One of them, he gives two bags of gold coins. One, he gives one bag. I don't know why God gives some people five, some people two, and some people one. 
I don't think it's because he likes you any better than anybody else. Because Jesus died for all and the ground is level at the cross. But he knows us well enough that he distributes to us resources based upon our journeys to make us more like Jesus. So some people are burdened with being wealthy and some people are burdened with being not so wealthy. But all of us have a journey to be like Christ. And that is ultimately the conductor of the orchestra. So in this case, the manager gives five, three, five, two, and one. And so number one servant and number two servant invested. They were smart. They doubled their investment. One went from five, one went from four. So when the master came back, he's very happy because, wow, I go away, I come back, my investment is doubled. Who wouldn't want to be uh, uh, happy about that? But the ser- third servant, who was a little bit scared of the master's uh, personality, decided to bury it under his tent. And when he came back, he thought, you know, sauntered up to the master and said, look, I've, I've kept your one bag safe. And the master said, are you kidding me? I gave you this opportunity and these resources, they're not even yours, to make a difference, and you bury it under your tent. Now, let me tell you, there are a lot of believers in this category today in the church because they're afraid that if they do something that God won't like them somehow. Well, let me tell you, the, the, the master said, okay, I'm going to take your talent away. I'm going to give it to the first servant who doubled from five to ten. So there was an increase for the one who obeyed and made the most difference. It's kind of like the difference between in being an investment manager and a security guard. we got a lot of security guards who don't want to take a risk. But God says, no, 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 if you're an investment manager, you're going to see the kingdom multiply. Not just add, not just change, not just, not just maintain, but you're going to see something happen that will multiply the kingdom. Because I will replace what you obey to give. And I know that God is faithful in that. So that's why we call this radical stewardship. Because it's more than just uh, a sense of understanding, again, how to just be generous in your giving. So I want to give you uh, what I call six deep-rooted principles. Number one, we're going to find what we call the spot mark deck, which is a practical principle. Number two, setting goals. Number three, financial plans. Four, managing spending, kind of a challenge for uh, some people. Planning for retirement. And then what Pastor shared with you earlier, number six, the big category that everybody loves about national stewardship is estate planning, your wills and powers of attorney documents or Free, F-R-E-E, four-letter word. It's a good one to say in church, amen? Whether it's videos or wills, well, you guys are saving a lot of money today. Between free thousands of videos and free thousands of dollars on wills, it's, it's a good Sunday in the house of the Lord. Somebody say amen. And by the way, Pastor, to answer your question from last Sunday's message, apple fritter, okay? I like Boston cream, but that's my wife. But see, I do listen. So... You better listen too. Find your spot marked X. How many of you like going to the mall? Well, that killed that point. There's, is there a mall local? <laughs> All right, I thought so. Now, when you go to the mall, if it's a big place and you want to just get in there and get out, because I'm, I'm a strategic shopper. I do not wander or meander. I do not like winners because I can't find anything I like in my shopping. Waste of my time. Sorry if you like winners, you're that shopper. or Whatever store where they have stuff in there that you have to find it. And you don't know what it's there until you go. So it's an adventure. My wife likes that. I'm not. I'm like, go in, get it, get out now because there's sports in the mall or whatever. It's hard, though, at the mall to know where to go if you don't know where you are to start. So you always find that little sign that says what? You are here. Isn't that kind of creepy, though? They always know where you are. <laughs> It's like a satellite thing. You're watching me. No, it's, it's, it's difficult to follow directions if you don't know where you are to start. So the, the important thing about stewardship is to get a sense of where are you at today? What's your understanding? Where are you at? How are you in terms of understanding the biblical model and the practical model for stewardship here? So to find your spot marked X, I always say, hey, be honest. If you're lost, admit it. It's okay. Or if you're, it's, it's, it's the open, it's kind of time to show and tell a little bit. Be thoughtful. How did you get to this place? Decisions that, that we make, we have circumstances, we live them. 
both spiritually and practically and be emotional. It's okay to get worked up a little bit. Like this couple who are going to sleep and he says, apparently I've done something to upset you. Man, did you see that? That is real barbed wire. And if that's your case, then by the way, during the will appointment, we don't do, I don't do marriage counseling. If you're having a problem, that's up to your pastor and his wife. I'm just telling you right now, because people get into appointments, they start talking to each other. I don't want to leave that to them. I'm like, okay, you guys, I'll go for a walk now, and I'll be back in a half an hour, and if there's no blood on the floor, we'll be good. So it's good to pray about these things and talk about them in advance so we don't upset each other. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, the Bible says, and all these other things will be added unto you. Don't worry about tomorrow. Here's the, here's the, the peaceful part of Scripture, the at peace with God part of Scripture, where I know that when God is with me, I can be happy. I can be at peace. I know that when I get something, I know that he will provide. I know that when I pray something, I know that he's listening and he's answering. I'm at peace with the fact that God is there with me. And so I won't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. But it doesn't say don't plan for tomorrow. Because good due diligence means good stewarding. And so we work forward in Scripture to see that God says, we have, I gave you a brain, people, let's use it. <laughs> and I gave you a heart, let's use it to, to make things that are going to make a difference. So here's an interesting, uh, what I call a law of personal economics. So this is a practical side. It's a kind of a simple exercise to help you find your spot mark X or where you're at today, your beginning point. And that is what I call the OO law of five. So pretty simple O number one relates to everything you currently own in your life. You've got stuff. O number two relates to everything you still owe on all that stuff. So you're paying the bills to make sure that it's yours long term, the house, the car, whatever. And so if you take one away from the other, what you owe from what you own, you get what we call your net worth. That's what we call your spot mark X. Where are you at today? And some people at this point say, uh, uh oh, <laughs> maybe that's why we call it the OO law of personal economics. So when you get to this point where you do a simple calculation, you get a sense of you know, where you're at. So here's an example. If you own 500 and you took away 200 owing, you're really worth 300,000. And so if you're, you know, if you're looking at your spouse and saying, you're only worth the half and half of stuff with you all these years, then you can go for marriage counseling and get that done. That's what that means. So here we have the big question now. What do I do to improve or change this spot mark X or this net worth position? How do I get better? How do I get out of debt? All those things. So stewardship principle number two is setting goals. We always talk about getting from here to there. Now, I had a little bit of this drive between Ontario and here because I live in Oshawa, Ontario, just outside of Toronto. And I got a lovely drive through the mountains and through the valleys and through the Cigar Sardin and into the Maple Spirit Straits. But it felt like this kind of a journey. And um, how long do you want to take to get to your goal in life? You want to take a month, a year, five years? Sometimes stopping and setting goals can be important. Goals should be set. They should be thought about. They should be specific. They really should be measurable. That you look at and you can see where it's going in increments. Goals really should be a process. You don't set them so far that you can't attain them when you get to the end. Goals really should be realistic. You, you really want to make them that something that you can actually do and not something that's outside of your your timing. They should be timely. They should be strategic and scheduled. You know, goals should be smart. This The greatest example for me in my life was when I was pastor in Sault Ste. Marie, a county board member gave me a one-month free membership at his gym. <laughs> Talk about freedom to act. I'm going to the gym. I headed out to Good Life Fitness there on the second line in Sault Ste. Marie, and I went in there, and I thought, well, I'm going to try everything. So I got on the first machine, and I got on the second machine, and I got on the treadmill, and I got on this, and I got on that. And I worked out every part of my body for like five or six hours. It was my day off, so I was doing all the training, not the sleeping. But uh, you, know, you know what ended up happening, though? The next day, I couldn't even get out of bed. My wife thought, you're just a bad wife. Because I overdid it because I didn't set goals. 
that were measurable or attainable or realistic, I was thinking, i got to get this in. And, you know, sometimes we who live by faith go past God in our faith for it. Sometimes we say, God, you want to do this, but you can do better than that, so I'm going to hold you to this. And God says, hold on a minute. There's a reason why I set the goal this far, because that's all you can handle today to make you more like Jesus. And if you go too far, you're going to get discouraged, and the enemy's going to get in there and say, you blew it. And God knows the pace of our lives better than we do. That's why every morning we wake up and say, Spirit of God, what is it today that I need to know more about you? Where should I go? What should I do? And what should I stop doing? And so they should be smart goals. So when we talk about practical things, we talk about creating a financial plan. And this is, again, a very practical thing. Four healthy steps. Make a commitment to God. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed, Proverbs 16. And then we talk about the second thing is getting help from informed people and reliable sources. No get quick, quick, rich seed really exist in the world as much as people believe and hopefully will. They don't. And so we need help from people who know what they're doing. So look at the look, Proverbs 21 says, the plans of the diligent lead to profitability, the fool's greed to poverty. So the Bible's telling us, hey, take it easy and take it one step at a time, folks. Live in the presence of God progressively. Invoke what I call the old McDonald law of economics. This one's good. It's the E-I-E-I-O. It's kind of familiar with a song that you know. You know what I'm saying? We won't sing it today, thank God. But... Um, But the EI, number one, means that you expect income, (laughs) hopefully, every month. Stuff comes in. There's also monthly expenses that are incurred. Money's going out. Money's coming in. So here's your personal economics. And so the EIEIO equals an outcome of plus or minus, depending on whether you overspend or you underspend, the money that you receive, right? Pretty practical, pretty straightforward. This is so spiritually practical. But let me tell you, obedience is a spiritual matter, no matter whether you're talking about money or your finances or your eyes or your feet. And so the expected income, by way of example, if that's the case, you're expecting this and you you end up getting that, and then the outcome is $200 plus. So you're actually improving your net worth with the extra $200. Your thought mark X is better than it was last month. That's when you don't overspend. So that's why spending, creating a financial plan is really smart, and it is something that you should do. Here's, here's how you can probably combat that the best. Number, w- This is the fourth thing. This is what I call the Einstein law of economics. And so we had the OO law, we had the E-I-E-I-O, and now we have Einstein involved, but you don't have to be a rocket scientist to get this one, okay? It's what we call the fire principle. So if you're a Pentecostal, you need some fire. I see Chuck's coming in September. You better be here for that because there's going to be fire. Trust me. I know Chuck. He lives just a half an hour from me in Bowmanville. And so I know the Lord wants to in, engage us in a real clear understanding that there's two ways we can change our spot mark X. You can either find more income. Yes, there's money growing on the trees in the backyard. Go grab it. Just harvest it. Yes, no problem. Well, how many of you know that that's not the case? So the reality is that the power that you have is to just reduce expenses. That's how you change things. You have the power over your account balance. So that's the fire principle, find income, reduce expenses. Both of those, either a combination of those, will help you with your net worth and improve your net worth progressively. So these will help you with your spot mark X. Here's the, so managing your spending is, is the battleground. This is principle number four. This is where people don't track very well, often. Some people do. Some people have their Excel spreadsheets, and some people have their apps on the phone from the Chartered Bank, and some people have all of this. And some people just go, eh, let's go get a $17 coffee from Starbucks anytime they want. And before you know it, They don't know where all their money went. So managing your spending is smart. The important players you're going to spend, number one, is God. Number two is Canada Revenue Agency, CRA. Somebody say yay. Wow. 
so enthusiastic. You and your family, that's important, that you're cherishing those around you, of course. Your employment, uh, they, you've got stuff for unemployment or if you have pension coming in and there's income tax and stuff, et cetera. Your creditors, you're paying your bills, you're paying off your credit cards, all of those things. And, you know, it's interesting because there are 400, uh, what, 40 million people in Canada right now, and there are over 100 million active credit cards in the United States. That is more than two per person men, women, child, or active consumer. And the average limit is $5,000 times that many cards. It's crazy what the debt load in Canada is right now. So paying off our creditors is part of our spending, and then our neighbors, which is a part of the ministry part of what we're going to talk about. So God, of course, comes first. The Old Testament, Malachi 3, you're familiar with the saints, many of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not pour out the treasures of heaven and pour out the seed among the flesh. So you will not have so much room to store it. Now, here is your, here is your theological moment this morning. This is the only time the scripture does this in the Bible. It's true. He says, if there's anything you're going to test me about, test me in this, that if you will be faithful, I will provide. And it's like a river that flows that as it goes out of your life, fresh water comes in. And it goes out of your life, fresh water comes in. And if you decide to put a barrier there or a barrier there, then what happens to the river when the water rises and stops flowing? It stinks. And God is saying, keep your life fresh. Keep your faith fresh. Keep your testing obedience fresh. And one of the ways that he says to do this is through the resources he's given us in partnership with in step with the spirit. So Malachi is clear that we are giving and we're faithful. The New Testament expression, Paul writes in Corinthians that whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. It's a principle that God will honor as we are in obedience to him. He says, each person should give what they've decided in their heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because if we're in this place of trust and the river's flowing in our lives, we're a cheerful giver, because we know God will provide, because we know he's available and faithful, and that he will, as I trust him, show up. So that's when the cheerful giver part begins, not out of compulsion or guilt. Wow. Wow. And this is what he, ta- he says to us. He says that he will make all grace abound to us, that in all things, at all times, having all that we need, look at this promise, that we will abound in having big bank accounts and comfy homes. No, that we will abound in every good work, which is external to my comfort zone, but it becomes a place of ministry calling that all of us are the priesthood of the believer that are giving and ministering in our world, not just the pastors, not just the staff, not just the board, not just the officers, but all of us who are saved are part of this journey to do good works. Can you imagine if the entire church got this message and embraced it wholeheartedly? There would never be a problem or a need or a shortage in the kingdom. It would be powerful. It would be amazing. Maybe it should start here, Pastor. I don't know. I say that to every church. And then I leave and I call back and I say, how's it going? And some pastors say, yes. And some pastors say, well, come back again. You know, (laughs) I will. No problem. I'll change the message. You know, it's interesting. And you're talking about conversations with Jesus in your series right now. Here's a great conversation with Jesus right here where Jesus and his disciples are in the temple and they're watching everybody give their offering. And here come all the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers and the rich people and they're all dressed up and they're all making a scene and they're showing off with their big gold coins to drop in. And here in this, here comes this poor widow who then puts in two very small copper coins. And the juxtaposition between the two is incredibly stark. The rich and the the widow. And Jesus, with his group, stops and says, hold on a minute, guys. Here's a teaching moment. Wait, look, and see. What do you see? You see this, and you see this. And what's more valuable to the Father than 
these people giving all their money out of their wealth or this one giving out of her poverty all that she has to live on far more valuable to the father because the heart the cheerful the non-compulsive the non-show-off Luke 21 the tax person we know that if we could write to Revenue Canada we could say dear Revenue Canada I'm ready to cancel my subscription Please remove me from your mailing list. <laughs> wow, if it was only that easy. <laughs> but reality is, is that we in Canada pay taxes, and Revenue Canada encourages us to give to God through charitable gifts. We even get a benefit back in our taxes, which we shouldn't necessarily expect as believers, but it's available to us, so why not, right? So we will receive about 40% of what we give to the church back as a taxable benefit, as a refund or as a, as a tax exemption. And we're being given back what we've already had deducted, and they're sending it home, right? So, you know, there's more good news that current tax laws can give tax credits up to 75% of taxable net income in certain categories. And estates, if you give taxable gifts in your will for charity, you can get up to 100% back, which goes back to your kids instead of going to the government. So there's an advantage in doing a charitable will. We'll talk about that. But our blessing as responsible citizen is to pay our fair share of taxes. So we can continue to have highways that are safe because I just used a whole bunch of them myself, and I'm thankful. And so we, are, we live in the greatest place in the world to serve God. Amen? If you're from another country, I like your country too. But I'm, I'm from Canada. I was born in Nova Scotia. I know I love this country. So it's all a blessing to me. Yeah, my parents did go from Bathurst to Nova Scotia, and that's where I was. So the rest of the story, you can talk to your kids about that. But it is God's will for us to pay our fair share of taxes. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to God what's God's. But we always say, what's our fair share? Get advice. Get the best tax bracket pocket that you can have good refunds, and you pay only what's necessary but that's good with someone who can help you out. Because plans fail for a lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed, according to Proverbs. So, all right, here are some saving ideas. There are, in our national office, we, we talk about gifts of securities that we try to tell people in the church to bless the church and your giving. Did you know that if you give stocks and you give securities, shares, to the church, that you get a double blessing by, you, you lose the capital gains tax on the, the invested amount of money, that is no longer your responsibility, and you get an income tax receipt for the full value of the investment. So it's a double blessing if you give securities to the church. We also talk about gift life annuities at our office for people 71 plus as an investment, annual income investment. Those are things that we provide as well as what we call term deposits for good interest based upon the chartered bank uh, GIC interest rates. It's competitive. And the, the money goes to sponsor missions and churches to build their, their buildings and do renovations. So there are some things that our office is now working on, just for your information, and Pastor, for yours as well, uh, that we are there to serve if you have any questions about some of these things. But you and your family are the most important thing in your life, of course, in terms of your spending. Your kids cost money, amen? Or your grandkids. I have three that just made it through university. I know all about this. So thankfully, they're all graduated now and on their own, but <laughs> we're empty nest. But uh, saving for rainy days is so important these days because you never know what's going to happen, how the economy is going to go, how the interest rates are going to go. Uh, COVID hits, and all of a sudden, people are off work, blah, blah, blah. On we go. We could come up with all kinds of end-time scenarios here. But the reality is, is we should be prepared in advance like Joseph did for seven years when he collected grain. And then there was a famine. He didn't even know it was coming. But they were ready. So sometimes we talk about having an emergency fund equivalent to three months income where you have an automatic transfer to a savings or tax-free savings account on a regular basis to get that emergency fund in place. I have just went through this with my daughter. She's just graduated, trying to pay off her student loans, trying to save for a place, trying to do all this at the same time. So she's now putting pockets of money into different places progressively to try and achieve her goals. And she's only 22, so if she can do it, we can do it. Because in the house of the wise are stores of choice foods but, and, and oils, but foolish people devour all they have in one sitting. 
So it's wise for us to spread it out a little bit. Our employer, we talk about paycheck deductions, Canada pension, employment insurance, company pension, union dues, health plans, all those things may come off your paychecks. Your creditors, you're always paying off Visa and paying off your mortgage if that's the case, the car loan. And I love this Proverbs 22, 7, one of my favorite verses is that the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. How many of you feel like you've been slave to Visa? 21.99% sometimes after 21 days. Wow. Let's get away from that as fast as we can. Amen? So we talk about getting out of debt. Stop any form of borrowing. Do a, a budget if you can, a spending plan we call it, or whatever, and start setting percentages for what you give to God, what you do at the church, what you do for your family, what you do for work, what you do for expenses, entertainment, and all of that stuff, and insurance, and all those things. Work out a payment plan with creditors if you're having uh, long-term problems. Call them and start talking because with silence means they send you to collections, but with conversation it means you have a plan to get you through. You know, exercise self-discipline. Stop spending if you can for stuff that's not necessary and seek counsel. That's just a quick word for those who might be in a little bit of financial trouble because these are really strong and helpful principles to get you through and learn to trust God through it all. And so your neighbors are important, and I always tell the story about the Good Samaritan, and you know that Christianity really taught the whole world about true charity. As per what the Bible has said, many of our charitable organizations in Canada were raised or started by Christian individuals or organizations. They may not be there now, but they were begun with the principles of the Bible. And so through the years, things morph and change but you know true charity began with principles like the 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 good samaritan and i'm not going to go th through the read through the whole story today but just summarize this that there is this poor man who's going down from jerusalem to jericho and he falls in the hands of robbers and he's beaten half dead and so he's left in the side of the road and so here comes what the the priest who is the uh the sort of like the pastor of the church who's passing because he's on his way to a board meeting, he passes on the other side. And so the Levite, who's kind of like the Bible college professor or the district leader, Kevin Johnson is passing by, and he passes on the other side because he's got to go to a meeting. And so the Samaritan stops, and he pours oil and wine and binds up the man's wounds, takes him to the inn, pays the innkeeper for his stay, and then says, I'll be back in a couple of days, and when I come back, I'll pay you the difference. Now that's going the extra mile, the extra mile, and even beyond, amen? And that is the, the story of the Good Samaritan. But the, what is wrapped around this story is a confrontation between a rich teacher, young man, and Jesus, who comes to him and says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you've learned this in the synagogue. What does the law say? And the young man says, well, Love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Oh, yeah, that second part. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you've answered correctly. So now, he says, now go do it and you will be fruitful and your life will be rich. And the man says, well, hold on a minute. Who's my neighbor? And that's when Jesus tells this story about the man from Jerusalem to Jericho. And at the end of the story, the young man's listening to all that happens and how those guys passed by and they should have stopped. So he says to the young man, he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? Well, the man, the young man had to say it. He said, well, it's the one who had mercy on him. There's no other answer here. You kind of put me into a corner there, Jesus. Hey, sometimes that's what he does, right? And he says, go and do likewise. So I'm really glad that you understood the theology of the love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. All your soul. I'm glad you understand that. But that needs to drop 18 inches into here to be processed and become reality. Not just theology, but practical theology, where we live it and go and do likewise. This is the greatest act of stewardship in Scripture, that Jesus himself, who said to do this, he himself, while we were still sinners, he died for us. He crossed the road. He bound up our wounds. 
He poured oil and wine on you, which are symbols of the Holy Spirit, and he took you to an inn, and he paid for your recovery, and he said, I'm coming back to pay again so that you'll be with me. There is no greater act of stewardship in the Bible than Jesus himself and how he responded to our woundedness and our lostness and our separation from the Father. He came and became that good Samaritan. So go and do likewise. That's what he says, practical theology. We know that God has called us to do those things. And right up until retirement, right through life, not just, not just while we're young and have the strength and we'll leave it to the young people because they're the ones with all the energy. No, we never retire spiritually, even though we plan to retire financially. You know, the greatest thing about retiring from your job is that you can then give it away for free to the church or to the ministry or to, to, to missions or to, to the culture or to society or to the community. You can start saying, hey, I'm really good at electrical stuff. I've been doing it all my life. Now I can put in some wires for the widow across the street to bless her so she comes to Jesus. I was a baker all my life. Now I can make cookies for my neighbors because I can tithe my career to God in my retirement years. I have more time to do it. So you never retire. Look at the interesting, the population in Canada from 61 to 2031 on average. We're talking about people who are retired versus the workforce, yellow workforce, purple retired. The workforce back in 19, whatever it was in 66, that's like before I was, I was born just before that, uh, was the retired people were few and the workforce was big. No problem paying for everybody who's retired, but now things have changed. So now we're heading towards a workforce versus retirement switch. So we have to make plans for retirement ourselves. Retirement planning, good time to look at it, 55, 65, 71. Canada pension is a constant payout. Old age security, yeah, you'll have security to get, get con constant payout. Company pensions, if you have them, are a constant payout if you have a defined benefit or defined contribution. Investments are really the way that we make a difference in our retirement income so that we can live comfortably and continue to do what God's called us to. So that's more of a variable payout, payout to reach, each, reach our retirement goals. So I don't talk about investing in our appointments. I'm not an investment manager, all of those things. I'm not, I'm not certified for that. But I do want to say one thing, that you should talk to an advisor about a ton of different kinds of investment possibilities and the risks involved in a lot of these things that are available to us nationally and uh, they're online through the chartered banks or through other companies uh, just to try and what we call take advantage of compound interest progressively interest on your interest on your interest so you go in as quick as you can you stay as long as you can you go as young as you can and then you make more long term even though the market may shift up and down up and down generally you do well long term so just FYI, those are some of the things, and we, which comes down to the final part. How many of you look at your neighbor and say, I'm so glad he's on number six? Go ahead. I can take it, because it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose, right? It's like crazy. But this is really important that you listen in the next few moments before we sign you folks up for the, the powers of attorney and the will document uh, drafting. First document, power of attorney, just to understand that in this province you are allowed to designate people to make decisions for you if you're unable to care for yourself. Now, I am able in the province of New Brunswick to write powers of attorney for personal care. If you want to do one for property or management of your property or your finances, you have to go to a lawyer, just FYI. But we provide the powers of attorney for personal care. That's your medical care if you are incapacitated for a period of time. And so power of attorney to su substitute decision makers, I do recommend you get the property one nevertheless, but you want someone to represent your decisions about property and personal care. There are two categories for powers of attorney. It's a substitute decision maker that you're allowing to act on your behalf, okay? Substitute decision makers, here's what you need to choose, a primary power of attorney, number one, your, your favorite person, which hopefully is your spouse if you're married, if not, go to the marriage counseling. 
That's three times. I'm setting you guys up. So if you're married, it should be your spouse. Okay, so when you're choosing on the paper that I give you to fill out, put, you don't worry about writing your spouse's name down there. I already assume it's going to be your spouse. But the second person should be a person that you trust if your spouse isn't available to help you with your personal care. So think about that. You might want to call them and ask them because it's kind of important to let people know you're, they're going on your legal documents. It's a courtesy. This can be more than one person, jointly and severally we call it. It can be two, et cetera, for the backup if you want. Okay? If you're a single adult, you need to choose a primary and an alternate that you trust. If one can't serve, then it goes to the alternate. Just so you know, powers of attorney. Here's a couple who are sitting there talking about their personal care, important discussion. And so they're sitting there and he says, you know, just so you know, I never want to live on a vegetative state dependent on some machine. That's pretty, pretty straightforward. Most people that I meet have that kind of conviction. Just let God be God. Let me go to be with Jesus if there's no reasonable hope of recovery. So he says, if that ever happens, just unplug me, okay? She says, okay. So what does she do? She unplugs her TV. Machine, vegetative state. All right, you got it. We caught up. So these are important discussions to have before you come so you can designate the people that you would, you would trust to serve you. Amen? All right, I'll just let that one go for a minute. Giggle, giggle. All right. The legal will. The second part of it is the, the will document that we provide as well, free of charge, saving you thousands of dollars in some cases, depending on the, the lawyer you go to. Only three out of ten adults in Canada have a legal will right now. This is not a great statistic. Hopefully we'll change that. Many say they don't have, to have enough to worry about or they're going to die penniless. Some say wills are only for the elderly. Well, I have a will. I don't feel old. I'm almost 60, but that's okay. I still think, think it's a good idea. Many say there's plenty of time. I wrote a will for a woman in a church in Scarborough a couple of weeks ago who was 94 years old. It was her first will. She said to me, why do I need this? I said, because you're 94? I said, I haven't seen any Methuselahs lately walking around, so you might want to consider getting a legal document done to cover your life. She goes, but pastor, I'm a little superstitious that if I write a will, that means I'm going to die soon. And I said, sister, God knows the day you're going to die. You better write a will. So we kept going back and forth. And she finally ended up doing it, but she did it kicking and screaming with her daughter saying, get her done, get her done. Because some people just think that somehow there's some kind of a weird thing going on by writing and talking about their ultimate demise. But it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. So, yeah, right, I say to people, you know, consider. So here are legal wills. James 4, the biblical side, as some of us think that we'll live forever. Today we'll go to another city, we'll make money, carry on business, etc. But what is your life is a mist that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. So we need to be due diligent during the time, good steward, while we're here. When do you need a new or updated will? When you're of legal age, where you reside, 19 years of age in the province of New Brunswick. Uh, if you're recently married or divorced, you want to either add a name or remove a name from your current documents. Uh, if you have children, you want to name guardians for your minor children. It's a crucially important thing to do to have because if you don't name guardians, the courts will decide generally where your kids are going to go, and it may not be where you expect. So having guardianship named in a will guarantees your children's destination. If there are special family concerns and you want to get those on paper, that's important. If you want to add a gift for the Lord's work, a charitable, I mentioned before about the charitable exemptions and the gift or the, the charitable gift back to your will if the government sends, if your estate wishes have changed. The key questions are who will be the primary and the secondary executor for your will. Again, as, if it's your spouse, they should be primary and everything is left to them, lock, stock, and barrel. But if it is both of you passing at the same time, much of the work we do in the appointment is the second plan if both of you are gone, couple, and who will be your executor? One person is smart. They shouldn't reside outside of Canada because there are some boundaries there. They should reside in Canada. And one person is best because everyone on the list is responsible for all the paperwork and all the due diligence. So you want to find a person that you trust, both of you, as an executor, you should call them and ask too. It's a good idea. Um, 
If you are a single adult, then you want to find a primary and a secondary executor again. Who will be guardian of your minor children? Please call them and ask if you're going to leave your kids to somebody. I can't be responsible for angry phone calls saying, my sister said she's going to leave me her six kids. She said you said she could do it. That happened to me once. And I said, I didn't say nothing like that. I said, she should have called you. I did have one lady call her sister and say, honey, I'm going to leave you my kids in my will. And her sister said, no. So then she was stuck. So please do it before the appointment. <laughs> Um, you know, those are important things to consider because you are asking someone to take, especially if you're like the, the Brady Bunch or something, you have six kids, like do you really want to leave six kids to the family without telling them? But nevertheless, how would you like your assets distributed? How would you like a charitable percentage to be included to reduce the taxes on your estate? Will you need a lawyer for more complicated situations? There are outer boundaries where I have to say go to legal counsel. I'm not trying to offend you or trying to steal your, per your free will. But there are some things that where we can't just do it. We have to let you go to somebody who's certified to do that, especially in some family law issues. So just so you know that in advance. Here's how a will works quickly. Spouse number one, who is happily living, passes and leaves everything to spouse number two. Everything in the will is what we call mirror wills to each other. The second thing that ends up happening is spouse number two, who is now a widow or widower, or if you are a single adult, then if you pass, then your executor creates an estate account at a lawyer's office. All of your stuff starts getting siphoned into this account. The first thing you have to do is pay your debts. It comes off the top. Your kids can't inherit your debt, by the way, but don't overspend. Your taxes, including capital gains, estate administration taxes, uh, in New Brunswick's called probate. It's a process of getting rid of all your stuff. It's called probate. Um, and the annual income tax for your final year of work or whatever. Those all come off the top, including legal fees. Whatever is left after that is called the residue amount, and that is distributed in shares to family, friends, kids, grandkids, whatever, in equal shares, however you want to do it. In percentages is the smart way because that means everything will be covered even if you don't know how much it is today. And so that is a traditional will. How long do you think it takes a beneficiary to spend his or her inheritance on average in Canada? Who's seen this before? Six months. Well done. You get a prize. Pastor has all the prizes. So the average, you get free videos from Right Now Video. The average inheritance is spent in about six months. So you want to be prayerful and considerate of where your resources are going. Here is the secondary option called a charitable will. It's completely the same as the traditional will. Completely the same. Everything's the same except for one thing. As soon as you add 1% to a charity and 99% to your kids or grandkids or whatever, it becomes a charitable will and you get a tax break for the charitable gift. It's a simple thing. That it, they're not completely different. They're not really confusing. It's real simple. Everything's traditional, except for as soon as you add a charitable name in there, it's charitable. And it, you're, you have the right to do that. So as soon as you add this percentage, it lowers taxes owing, leaving money coming back into the estate. Here's an example of 10% charitable gift can return 40 to 50% of a donation tax credit back to the estate. Instead of going to the government, it's going to a charity and your kids are still getting the payout in the meantime. And as a result, the residue of your estate is distributed to your family friends, like, like the traditional will, but also to the charity, which adds that dimension. So that's an option during the appointments we can discuss. If you bring it up, you want to talk about it, I'm happy to do so from, from this point on. Due to what we call the law of undue influence, where people who are writing your will can't influence you in any way, just answer questions. I won't talk about it in the appointment. It's up to you to bring it up because I can't influence you in any way during the appointment. If you do a traditional will, happy to serve. If you do a, a charitable will, happy to serve. So just so you know that if you want, that has to come up by your volition. Charitable will recognizes the blessing of God. Here are some of the advantages. It expresses go a good steward personal philosophy where we don't store up for ourselves treasures on earth but we're kind of sending them towards the heavenly treasure chest where moth and thieves can't break in, steal or eat or destroy. And so this is kind of an investment in continued as you've done all your life in the church and ministry and missions. 
And so it demonstrates personal values to other family members as a legacy, helps to uh, self-satisfaction of generosity all your life and right to the end. And of course, it helps offset taxes, which is great. CRA, our favorite people, right? So it's all good when you are going one way or the other, depending on your family model. Uh, estates that have a lot of capital gains from investments or property have an advantage for a charitable expression because they get an income tax break. Younger families that don't have as much of an estate are generally leaving the majority of it to their kids anyways to get them raised through the years. So those are usually more traditional wills unless they have a personal conviction to give to charity. Anyways, we honor that, of course. So just those are the differences. I hope that makes sense to you to try and just clarify that. But that's part of the journey. So here is what God will say to us as we are good stewards in our lives. This is the conclusion, the last verse. Somebody say amen. amen. Well done, good and faithful servant. This is what we want the Lord to say, right? This is where we want to stand in a place where God says, you did great. So just trust and obey. Because there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And he will make us and put us in charge of many things. Share in his happiness. He's promised these things. This is all part of the promises of God. So if you're scared and conservative, I encourage you to be confident and free in Jesus. So as we hand the service back to the pastor, just really quickly, the appointments, as he's mentioned, made. They'll be up in the conference room upstairs as the day progresses today and tomorrow. We're scheduling appointments right away after the service. If you come forward and you're interested, just come to the center pews, sit down. The rest of the folks can meet in the foyer and have their chit-chat and coffee and stuff. And we'll do a little bit of question and answer if you have any, and then we'll do the sign-ups. I'm going to hand you, or Pam's going to hand you, a fill-in form that you can take and fill out fully, print, please, in English, Anglais, um, to make sure that I can get your records correct when I'm doing the inputting. And then we'll chat after that. But just take that, fill it out, bring it to the appointment fully filled, and then we can proceed from there when you arrive. So you'll take it with you. Here's a couple of quick things. Please read and complete the pre-appointment form. Bring it with you. Second thing is couples, both spouses must attend. I, you can't sign for your wife or your husband as much as you want to. And you can't say everything to me, plus all the life insurance, you know, I'm whatever. Um, parents, please seek child care for the appointment. It's really difficult to do an appointment when there's child management going on because we're talking about some serious things. Ten minutes late usually means that we have to either postpone or cancel. Now, because I'm from Ontario, I won't have any um, pre-postponing times. So it'll be like you got to show if you can because there won't be sufficient time. And if you need to cancel, please call the church in advance to surrender your spot if there's anybody waiting. That's it. That's all I got. And that's enough. Pastor, thank you. Thank you, folks, for your kindness. Thank you, David. That was uh, very helpful. And uh, I, I know, as he said, you probably felt at points like it was a fire hose of information. Good thing it's all online and you can go back and watch it again. If there were helpful things in all of that uh, stewardship content that, that you think, you know, that would really help me to get a hold of some of those uh, those instructions and teachings, uh, you can always go back and look at that again. I want to close in prayer. And uh, if you have no interest in, uh, in taking advantage of this service, you're free to, free to go. You can go have a coffee or visit in the lobby or, or, just, or just go. Um, and, uh, but if you, if you would like to take advantage of the service, we encourage you to stick around, come on up, and uh, we'll have a short time of opportunity for Q&A, and you can sign up. Uh, but let's pray as we close today. Would you stand? Let's stand. Father, we, th we thank you for your love and goodness and faithfulness to each one of us, God, that you are at work in our lives and that, uh, God, w we, are, we truly are so blessed in so many ways. Thank you that uh, thank you that you're a good a good papa, a good father, that you provide and you care for us, and uh, and thank you for these tools that that will help us to be 
even better stewards of what you have blessed us with. God, I pray for each person here today that you would go with each one of us to know that we are part of your kingdom, to know that we are part of your, uh, your good plan for this world. You've called us to live our lives as worship to you. And as we do so, we will have an incredible impact in the world around us. God, may you go 